Hey everyone, welcome to the Modern Merchant Podcast. I'm your host, Travis Marier. Today we've got Levi Zahn, the owner of White Rhino Arms. Levi, appreciate you joining, man. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So if you don't mind just getting us kicked off with a quick overview of White Rhino, tell us a little bit about your business and we'll go from there. Yeah, so um, White Rhino Arms is a uh, online e-commerce only fireman accessory uh, retailer. Uh, we were established in 2020 and uh you know we just we just like to provide um the tactical firearms and accessories to the american fire enthusiast community um and that's us in a nutshell yeah american enthusiast community so you know how do you guys so if you think about your customer base um you, you mentioned enthusiasts which you know that is when it comes to selling online selling retail online especially being just online pure play you got to kind of go after that that niche, right? Like who you're going after, that enthusiast usually is the best customer. You know, is there a way that you target those specific customers? How do you kind of think about who your primary customer is? Yeah, so our primary customer, um, I'd say it's about 50 military, law enforcement, um, active, retired veteran, and then the other 50% it's just, you know, American gun enthusiasts that have, you know, the gun community has grown, you know, over the last century, obviously. Um, and it's become more modernized and, you know, due to the more recent, you know, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the industry as a whole has kind of started moving towards the tactical side. It's not just hunting and shooting for sport or competition. Um, you know, there's a lot of the tactical side as far as self-defense, you know, so there's a lot of different um, areas within the community. Those people fit into and a lot of products that we sell that cover those bases. Yeah. No. Okay. Makes sense. And so you, you cover a lot of those, um, like you said, in the tactical side, you cover that whole full spectrum when it comes to buying firearms, buying uh, tactical gear, things like that online, you know, there's a lot of different companies out there. There's different marketplaces, different ways to buy this. How do you guys think about differentiating? If I'm looking for one of the products you sell, you know, am I finding you first and that's why I'm buying from you? Are you going to be cheaper? Are you going to have better support? I'm just curious how you differentiate in general. So we try to keep all our prices fair. We try to keep them as low as possible. You know, we're always um, going to be restricted to, you know, math and advertise price and um, whatever the brand that we're selling has us restricted to as far as that. We run sales, but not as often as others maybe. Um, and there's a lot of social media sharing that goes on through the companies too. Like you try to promote their product and they're trying to promote you as a dealer that helps with sales as well. Um, but you just try to, you know, I don't really know exactly the way to describe it. You just need to be presentable to the consumer where they may want to buy from you because, you know, your price is lower than others or because, you know, there's. Um, that's more satisfaction from previous orders that you've, you know, provided to them. And what would you do? Right. right. Running a good business, making sure not only do you have the products that people want, but also that you're supporting them along the way and supporting them post sale. It makes, makes complete sense. Um, cool. So I know you've been with us, I think over six months, maybe somewhere between six months and a year, but the company as a whole, can you talk about launching the company a little bit maybe, or just like what you've been doing this past year and then kind of how that might shift in your priorities and goals for this upcoming year? Sure. So, um, we started the company in, um, April of 2020 and then we went live August of 2020 online. Um, we initially started with a company called gear fire. They were essentially all in one platform um you know they give you a website platform they integrate with a specific list of distributors and coming into the industry it was very helpful because we had just you know initially came on didn't have a lot of knowledge of the industry as a whole just from personal experience um and so we got integrated with that but one of the issues we had from the start is there's not much customization um, they pull from the distributor feeds, they integrate it into their feed, which then goes to your website. You, anytime you want to change anything, you got to contact someone and it takes time. Um, and so they were going to come out with a new platform. Um, we decided to part ways before that happened. And we went with another company that initially we thought was better, um, but they were really the same thing, just had a little bit more customization and that didn't go as well as we wanted it to either and uh main for 
when we initially started, most of our sales were happening on Gunbroker, right? And it's because Gunbroker is a platform that's across the entire United States. Not nobody, not everybody knows about white rhino arms, right? But Gunbroker, if you're in the community, they usually know that. So we started selling a lot of products on there. And what I noticed one time was there was multiple listings of the same product and all the same data, but for multiple dealers. So light low click that I'd never thought of before. I was like, this has to be integrated from somewhere. And so I started doing some research and that's where I came about with inventory source. And uh, so right after the weekend was over, contact inventory source got set up with them, skipping flex point mainly because of the price point. But from the jump, inventory source was what, not what we needed as well. You know, there was a lot of customization that we couldn't do and we had to contact someone for. And I didn't want that. I, I wanted to be able to just jump in and do what I needed to do. So, um, Anthony had contacted us from FlexPoint soon thereafter, and uh, we discussed with him and came up with a plan, and we went with FlexPoint in December um, of 2020. So it's been, it's been about 16 months, um, and uh, yeah, went from there, and FlexPoint has been the best thing that's happened for us because now we're able to sell on two channels, Gun Broker and our website. We're able to integrate all our distributors that we weren't able to integrate with those other places. They had just had a few. But with FlexPoint, it's essentially all of them. There's a few of them that we haven't been able to integrate. Um, it's been really great. So, awesome. No, that's great to hear. So that's that's interesting. So you launched right after COVID, like or what after COVID, as in like right at the, the start of COVID, right? So March 2020, you were you were you said April you launched of 2020. Were yeah. So yeah, you launched right there, and then in that span uh, up to December, you went from Gear Fire to ammo ready to inventory so what is, what, was it ammo ready you no said? it was um connected data solution cds gotcha cds so you, you went from am, uh gear fire to uh cds to inventory source and then found your way to flex point kind of getting to that, that period of you know <laughs> kind of just testing out all the different software options out there and you ended on flex point you're up and running on flex point um, and you sell on Gunbroker and it's WooCommerce, is that correct? You chose WooCommerce? Yes. Yeah, how did, can you talk about how you kind of went down that path and selecting that, uh, as a platform? Uh, so the, um, company that built our website, it was automatized and I had, um, meetings with them before we initially went fully on to build the website. I, I didn't do a lot of research on it, but I know, you know, within the firearms community, there's a couple other, um, industries that are looked down upon as a whole you know there's right. three big three and so big karma commerce had went anti gun at one point and a lot of people lost their platform what i was told i didn't do a lot of research on it i do kind of remember something like that happening i don't know if it was them and then it came back and i said well i don't want to take that chance and so i just went with woocommerce so i'm not throwing them under the bus or anything i don't really know that's just what i was told and so um, I went with WooCommerce and I haven't had any issues since. Yeah, yeah. No, WooCommerce is a great open source platform. Uh, I've never heard of big commerce going uh, the opposite. You know, if anything, we've been partnering with them a lot on on uh, firearms integration. I know Shopify did for sure. Shopify went anti-gun. There's no doubt yeah. there. That's their that's their thing. So, um, but, but yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And, and that's what we typically see. We typically see the big commerce, number one, WooCommerce, number two, and then Magento for kind of more you know, the, the guys that have been in the game for a while um, that want to deal with the what is Magento, right? The the complexities there and the, the maintenance there. But um, cool. So I was just curious how you kind of you got, went down that path. And it sounds like, you know, and we can see that a lot. It, it comes from the agency. The agency typically drives the platform they're comfortable with, that you're comfortable um, yeah. kind of taking their consulting on. So uh, based on a sense. So that's your whole tech stack, right? I mean, if we look at your tech stack, it's uh woocommerce you you have flexpoint integrated to that and you've got gunbroker also integrated to flexpoint um what else is there any other technology you're using uh anything else in the tech stack that might be helpful to others in your industry that might uh find benefit of that yes ship station okay uh, so we didn't have with uh, connected data solutions and gearfire they had their own integrated honestly i don't even remember which one was which but um, they have their own integrated shipping stuff, right? So I have accounts at the big three, you know, USPS, UPS, FedEx, yep. um, and then the different fire firearms accounts for those. Um, and so there were times where I would use their stuff, but it was really painful because nothing was connected, right? If I shipped through them, it was connected, 
but I was still getting better rates on most stuff through my other accounts. So then I had to go log in and then I had to manually input all the information. With ShipStation, it just comes straight through whatever the customer inputs, goes straight to the order. And you're basically hitting the button to print a lady, you know, because most yep. of the time though, the weights and dimensions are already in there. Some of the distributor data doesn't come into FlexPoint as far as that. So, you know, we have to manually intervene on that. Most of it comes through and you're just clicking a button, label spits out, you know, um, but we also, that's only for the manual orders that we process. You know, we're online e-commerce. We depend on dropship fulfillment for 95% of our orders. And out of the, out of that 95% that we depend on for drop ship, some of them, and if not, I'd say about maybe 10%, whether there's certain brands like Glock that don't allow anybody to drop ship any of their products. So we place the order to the distributor, they turn around, send our dealer account ship to us, we turn around and ship it out. So that customer order data sits there. And once we receive it from the distributor, then we go print that label and ship it out. So ship station is also very beneficial for us. Yeah, no doubt. And that whole cross docking flow, that's, you know, when we build out FlexPoint, that cross docking flow was definitely in our mind, specifically for Glock and, and brands like that, that require you to do that. And that's why we've loved partnering with ShipStation is that they add that label aspect uh, to allow the cross docking to go from the drop ship supplier to your um, actual, whether it's, you know, your, your warehouse or your brick and mortar or wherever you're storing uh, or shipping out of, and then going on to the actually to the FFL at that point then, right? And to the, uh, the um, FFL transfer company that you're working with, right? That's it's a firearm, yes. Right, yeah. it's a firearm. Oh yeah, so fair enough. Like a lot of times you can just ship it out directly to the consumer. Correct, um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, talk about FFL transfers and that flow. That's why FlexPoint has like doubled down in this industry is that is a complex flow that a lot of software out there does not handle very well. We set out to, to solve that exact challenge at the cross docking across multiple different sources and then splitting if it's a firearm, not a firearm, getting it to an, uh, an FFL, doing the transfer for you. Can you talk about the transfer, like the concept of FFL transfer, just for those that might be watching this on YouTube, want to get into firearm uh, selling online or just new to it, uh, just the concept of that, that flow and what an FFL transfer is. Yes, yeah, so um, that's essentially when it comes to any of the firearms, whether it's Title One firearms, which is normal, you know, handguns, rifles, shotguns, or Title II, which is a silencer, short barrel rifles, machine guns, all that stuff. We do not transfer anything to the end user ever. We don't even do it in, in person here in Wyoming. We are 100% FFL to FFL transfer on all those. So we've had people local here contacts is be like hey can we come do the transfer to you no you can't um but i will once we receive it i will go drive it across town and drop it off for you and they're okay with that you know so when it comes to um the other stuff that's obviously not local whether it's in the state of wyoming or out of the state of wyoming um the order comes through you know the flex point system and um all the information there i'll just verify it um, the one thing that we always do, I can't speak on other FFLs, is even though there's a valid FFL license that's presented with all the orders, whether it's from gun broker or we get an order on our website and we have to contact them, we always run it through the um, ATF FFL Easy Check. It's their yeah. online website, and that actually um, validates that this is an actual FFL and not fraud. We've never had one be fraud. It can be one in a million, right? So once we verify that, then we actually accept the order and say, hey, this is actual legitimate. If it's a drop ship fulfillment, you know, hit process and it'll send from FlexPoint to whatever our connected distributor is. Um, if it's not, then we go to the distributor and we order it ourselves, and it gets uh, shipped directly to us. Now, the drop ship fulfillment FFLs, there's, there's even people that have federal firearms licenses and they don't understand how or that this actually works. And you know, it's a small part of that. Um, we don't even have to touch it. We don't have to acquire it in our A&D books. We don't have to dispose of it. It goes straight from that FFL to whatever the receiving FFL is, and we just take the profit, right? Um, the ones that come to us, obviously we have to acquire them in our books. And then when we ship them, we dispose of them to the FFL they're going to. And then that's that. That's that's the whole process in a nutshell. But um there's a misconception still i think i think the knowledge on firearms has grown obviously over the past you know couple decades as a whole because there's a lot of anti-gun groups and this and that and whatever all firearms when they come from an ffl 
have to, we're required to do background check. Right. Have, now, if I send it to another FFL, obviously don't, but when they go to transfer it from that FFL, they have to get it. There's misconception that people buy stuff online and you're shipping it to their door. That's, that's not how it works. Now, I'm not saying it's never happened. I can guarantee it's happened before and there's FFLs that have lost their license, went to prison, whatever, but that's not the way the law actually works and people don't understand that. So I'm on here saying that it has to transfer with a background check, just so they know that. Yeah, a hundred percent. That would be insane to think that, you know, you have to go to Academy Sports or Dick's or wherever you can buy your guns locally, but you can go buy them online. You have to, you can circumvent the system, right? That's not, that's not the case. So yeah, I appreciate you clarifying that for those that, that might not know. And, and that's exactly the case, right? You, the, the order comes in, you, you have the preferred FFL kind of that is on the order that you want to ship it to. Um, you then from there, uh, determine, right, you, you actually go through and double check, right? You make sure through um, FFL checker, easy checker, right? Um, that it is actual valid, which is a great next step. And then from there, you'll ship it directly to the actual brick and mortar. Typically it's like the local gun shop, right? And that, and then that exactly. consumer bond your store goes to a different local gun shop and picks it up. Is that a fair, that's a fair assessment, right? Correct, yeah. So it, it could be, you know, an e-commerce only or home-based FFL or whatever, you know, like I am that actually does face-to-face -face transfers, but it's I'm shipping it directly to another federal firearms licensee that actually has a valid one, and they are the end state for that consumer who's going to go to them and do their transfer. They're going to get the background check, pay for the transfer, whatever it is that they need to do through them, whatever their policies are, right? But um, it's just going for me to another FFL and that's it. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's another good point you brought up is that you don't have to go through the process of, you know, the bound book, uh, ledger, if you're, if you're not touching the firearm at all, right? Like you don't have to have serialization and all that kind of stuff and that complexity there with the, the bound book and, um, fast bounds and all those of the world, uh, if you're not touching it, but then in this case where it's a Glock and it comes into your physical location you do need to do that um right. and so having something to manage all of that right like a flex point helps with a good portion of that uh is is, is kind of you know why you found us originally and then yeah it's, it's kind of crazy to think that you might get an order of a firearm or ammo or and then also you have firearm ammo and then maybe like a holster right a non-ffl required item having to manage all of that, right? There's different laws around ammo, depending on states. There's different, obviously firearms have their own restrictions we just talked about. And then the holster doesn't need to go through an FFL. So figuring out, okay, do I ship all of this to the FFL? Do I just ship the ammo and the firearm? Uh, do I split off and send the, um, the holster directly to the consumer only? So there's a lot of challenges there that, you know, require an OMS in your industry, which is uh, kind of why we decided to tackle it. But I'm curious in that scenario, do you, in that scenario, do you ship all, do you send all of it to your FFL? Because I know that the, the brick and mortar gun shop might not want that holster showing up. Uh, I'm curious how you think about an order like that and how you treat those orders. So I try to be as efficient as possible. Like efficiency is one of the key aspects of white right arms in this business. Um, there are, there is one state that we do not ship firearms units, California. We do not, we don't do I could have guessed that one. But yeah. we don't. And the reason yeah. why is because um, they put extra steps on top of an FFL that's not even within their state. I don't follow California state laws. I follow federal firearms laws. So. You know, when they get the California Department of Justice and require you to create an account in their CFLIC system and get approval to ship it, I'm not doing it. It's just what it is. And as far, so we shipped to the other 49 states that um, don't require it. Alaska and Hawaii, um, we're a contact first just because the shipping is so high. Sure. Um, but we do ship there. Um, and then when it comes to ammo, there's, um, I, off the top of my head, there's seven or eight states that we don't ship to ammo to. It's all the states that require an extra step or, or the customer has to have a FOID card or whatever. We don't ship it. If it cannot, if we cannot ship ammo directly to the individual, we don't ship it there. Um, and it's just, it's me. I'm, I'm sole person, owner, operator, everything for this business, um, which I think we're going to talk about here coming up, but. Um, yeah. it, it's kind of, you know, we try to remain efficient. So, um, when it comes to an order like that for a state, sometimes, you know, I can contact FFL first and you're like, Hey, do you care? You know, and then you just ship it straight to them. They get everything for customer handing off. Um, but if it's like, you know, free shipping on that distributor or there's something like that, 
I can I can break it off. You know, you can create separate you know orders within the order on FlexPoint. You know, and um, said that way. Yeah, since you bring it up, and I, I know we're going to get into it a little bit, but you know, what? How do how do you use FlexPoint? Right? Like, do you leverage the order like the state based order routing or order kind of workflow rules to kind of manage the ammo use cases? Do you? You know, I'm just curious. Is it? Do you use the order side a ton? Do you use the inventory kind of product listing side? Just I would love to kind of learn like where you see the most value and kind of how you use FlexPoint in general. So out of all the distributors that we have connected, um, they all have amazing shipping except one. Um, one of them likes to use UPS SurePost a lot, which is a, a very confusing to customers. It's very um, low budget. It's UPS and then in, um, when it gets to the um, end point, it switches over to USPS, issues a different tracking number under USPS and then gets delivered. And it's very confusing customers. Well, all the other ones have, they usually ship ground, which gets there in, you know, two to five business days most of the time. Um, so we don't have to leverage the distributor location. You know, we do use the rules, the workflow, ch channel status workflow rule, I believe it's called, right? Or no, that's not it. It's, it's, it's order the import, order import the, rule, maybe. The order workflow, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. But anyways, we don't, we don't have that top. What we have is... Um, it's mainly the pricing, pricing strategy, um, of course, what's going to give us the most profit and then also stock status and then um, the distributors that process orders the quickest. When we have one distributor that is very automated within their warehouse, like robots and stuff, and then we have other distributors that are still manually fulfilling. So we do rack and stack distributors on who we've had the least issues with in the past. Um, who could get the customers to order the quickest and this and that and whatever. So um, we leverage, leverage FlexPoint in that aspect by ranking distributors for who we consider is the better one, right? Um, and those are also usually the ones that have a lot more um, product stock in stock. Right, right, makes sense. Awesome, cool. Um, what else, anything else as far as using FlexPoint, you know, just a better understanding kind of how you guys use it uh, from the inventory or the product publishing perspective. Maybe talk a little bit about GunBroker. Curious uh, your experience there. So GunBroker is its own separate animal. Um, they have a lot of, from our perspective, we're trying to publish products there to get them listed, right? They have a lot of listing rules and a lot of it that we have issues with is within their title policies. Can't have the same word twice. Uh, Sometimes these distributors in their feeds, they'll have like dashes between stuff. It rejects that. So then we get all these errors and we have to go in and we have to fix it. And it's somewhat painful because with GunBroker at any given time, you have 30 to 40,000 listings on there. Um, we used to have a lot more, but we kind of um, took some brands off there because we were having problems with their products. Like customers were receiving them, there's rust on them and whatever. So we kind of, we use that a lot on FlexPoint too to block certain stuff from even coming into our catalog. So with GunBroker, once it's listed, it's it's pretty easy to manage. I mean, it stays listed. Customer buys it. You know, if it's if it's once it goes down to zero stock, it's delisted. Once it comes back in stock, it's listed. Um, but it's a completely different animal than what we do on WooCommerce because on our website we have back and slot notifications, so we leave everything listed on there, right? But with our website, we're more focused on specific brands for that are higher quality. You know, maybe there's some hot items that are, you know, always going to be, and we, you know, showcase them on our website. Um, we're about to start using the bundling tool on FlexPoint because that's a great option to have. But they're just, they're both two different systems. And so we essentially on the back end, we got to treat them different too, you know. So WooCommerce is, it was more intense on, um, getting the titles right because we have the little title titling conventions that we use on our website um every single image from every single product we have integrated into woocommerce has been uploaded by me personally um the forty thousand on gun broker there may still be some wrong pictures out there because it happens we get to them when we do but it's forty thousand items that I, I just can't get to all of them you know so they're two different animals within themselves gun brokers more of them just let it publish and we find issues when we find them. If a customer asks, we'll change it, you know, but WooCommerce is, and that's coming from the distributor. That's, 
it's nothing with flex point it's whenever they publish in their feed you could have five different distributors with the same five same product five times they'll have five different titles five different images five different descriptions and you got kind of choose one to rack and stack and with who it's going to pull through and right. even that one sometimes has mistakes too. So it's yeah. Well, you bring up the the rack and stack, which I like that terminology. By the way, you might steal that. Um, you know, it's it. You do that for the order side, which you talked about earlier, right? When orders come in, who do you prefer to sort uh, source that order from? Um, you know, lowest cost or preference, and then but also pushing products up. It, they both have the exact same holster, let's say. And that holster comes in, one's got a great description, great title, the other one doesn't, but the other one has a great image. You kind of, it's something you do use the flex point kind of priority uh, product building uh, side of things as well. Is that correct? I do. Yeah. And so even if one distributor has great images, they're not the ones that are usually first for title. So I, I have them, each different section, title, description, image, all that, I have them all you know, they're all mixed up. And right now, the way it is, it works pretty good. So I just leave it. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, just in general, I mean, I, we're kind of coming up on our time here. Uh, you know, anything from an industry perspective, anything we didn't touch on when it comes to FlexPoint? Um, yeah, what, what did we not talk about that maybe we should have? So I think, you know, moving into the future with a lot of the e-commerce platforms right it's grown and grown and grown and grown the internet saturated with e-commerce platforms you know e-commerce retailers um people working from home and it's still growing and so i was doing some research you know um over the past week it's interesting to look at the um, consumer spending right and so when you look at consumer spending you still have you know the mid 30s to the mid 60s are the main age group that are doing the consumer spending because are more established you know they have more established jobs they have money saved up they may have more cash on hand right but if you look yeah. at um i was if you just scratch the surface and do a little bit of research i found one um website i was talking about it and when you look at consumer online spending like um people that are buying stuff online amazon you know walmart.com or white rhinewarms.com whatever it's still um almost 50 percent of the 18 to 25 age group and, and then the next age group, like 25 to 35, it's about 30%. And then all the rest, they only make up about 20%, right? Mm -hmm. And so as these generate, these younger generations get older and older and older, and the younger generations are born and come up, it's gonna continue to go up and up and up and up. And then a brick and mortar, I mean, people are, there's people that are still gonna always want to see stuff in person before they buy it. I, I'm not saying they won't. It's not going to become 100% online e-commerce retail, but the percentage of growth is going to t continue to rise. Yeah. So yeah. there's always that. And when you're doing it online and don't have brick and mortar, that's also less overhead. So it's, it's very enticing for certain businesses to do it that way. Um, yeah. They need more of your revenue that's coming in because you have less overhead. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's, that's some great kind of numbers to like back back up the the idea and the kind of conversation as of late that you know in the reselling business which you're in um right you're not a direct to consumer brand you don't have your own brand you're reselling other products that are available uh to other resellers right and you really have to pitch yourself to those brands to those suppliers and distributors on like why why they would want to work with you um and a lot of times as a brick and mortar it's easy i i have this location in this town that's my your customer base they're going to buy from my store right and i will buy a wholesale um pallet of it and now we just had this conversation with prevail ventures a couple months ago a month or two ago where you know they're in the similar industry more in kind of like the bow hunting tactical you know they're getting into a couple of different industries but you know it's similar to kind of what you're saying like online retail is is really growing so much that these suppliers and distributors are opening up to new reasons why they might work with a reseller that is, is not just because of their physical location brick and mortar right you differentiate your customer service your your curation your your audience right you see the the, the rise of influencers in general um and having an audience it doesn't mean it's a physical audience. It's a, uh, you know, it's a following online, um, you know. So I think those barriers are breaking down more and more where you can be a pure play online retailer like yourself. More people are shopping online, but also more suppliers are being open to working with digital first, digital only 
retailers, which I think is key and, and has always kind of been like, uh, you know, dropship has been a bad word. Like, I don't, why should I dropship for you? I can just sell my own stuff and um, go direct to consumer. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that's a super interesting conversation that we've been having and, and you kind of got some numbers to back, you know, why that conversation should be kind of front and center. Yeah, there there's still a few handful of distributors out there within the farms industry. They won't touch us. They won't allow yep. us. There's some brands out there too. Colts one of them, Lube Pull Hot Picks, um, Night Force, you know, there's some stuff out there that they won't touch us and it's their loss, you know. I mean, I always I just I just fear they hate money, but you know. Um but you know, there's also a downfall to doing it this way too is um customer loyalty. I, I have a handful of customers that are, you know, pretty loyal um but there's less than five and they're very loyal you know when you have a brick and mortar store that people can come to you're gonna they just have a lot more customer loyalty because it's local and they can go there and see stuff and buy stuff when you're online there's not it's all about the cheapest person um i call them little gremlins they're over in um reddit and the facebook chat groups and like hey this place got this whatever and then they go buy a knot and everybody else is just stuck with the you know, product because you know maybe they can't sell them as cheap as other you know maybe they're not in a position where they have to offload stuff to get a return on investment so it's very cutthroat um so i just try to always do the right thing by them all the time you know we have a lot of strict store policies that protect us as online only um you know we don't we're very strict when it comes to returns because we i can't take returns for the most part because a lot of it's drop ship and most of the distributors, they're not going to take a return unless the wrong item was shipped, you know? So there are trade-offs and as we move into the future, we'll just see how acceptable the consumer base is going to be. No doubt. Well, Levi, I appreciate it, man. A lot of great insights here, especially in your industry and the FFL kind of online reseller space. Uh, a lot of good kind of tidbits along the way in this. So uh, I appreciate all the insight, man. Thanks again for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you guys and the support you give. I do. Thank you.